It's a pleasure to be here, and I just want to thank Back 40 Grill for hosting this event as well. How many are here for the Climate Science Center, Science by the Glass? Great. Wow, good audience. So thank you for being here. Um, so when you look at my title, I hope you realize that tails in my title really did refer to the tails of these organisms, because I'll be discussing how climate change has affected um, everything from uh, whales and penguins and seals uh, today. Um, back in 19, uh, sorry, 2013, um, I went on a research cruise uh, for the Palmer Station Long-Term Ecological Research Program. And it was an amazing experience, and the goal of the Palmer Research Station is to uh, under, better understand the mechanisms by which climate change and uh, ocean physics and sea ice extent and duration affect uh, penguins and krill and whales and seals. And so I hope today I will instill in you a sense as to how climate change effects have percolated through the ecosystem. Can you hear me okay, by the way? Yeah? Okay, great. First, I'll talk a little bit about uh, where Palmer Station is. It is here on the Antarctic Peninsula. You can kind of see uh, South America jutting here, and this is the Drake Passage. So, on our research cruise, we went from Chile uh, to the northern part of the Antarctic continent. This is actually the peninsula part. So, one thing that you will notice, uh, so you know the Andes are right here, and they kind of will extend below the ocean, all the way into Antarctica. So basically, the same mountains in Antarctica have actually been formed through the same geological processes that have also formed the Andes. And so you can find amazing mountain ranges such as these on the islands of South Georgia. And this is in Antarctica. And I know it's a little dark in here, but there are some penguins somewhere over here that I can't help the light. So I just want to share with you a few cool facts about Antarctica. First of all, if you don't see any wildlife, you will see the evidence of wildlife. And you can see some of these ice flows here. And you can see some tracks here. These were made by seals. And then there are some tracks here in the background, and they were made by penguins. So let me tell you a little bit about Antarctica. It is the coldest, the driest, um, highest and windiest continent on this planet. It is capped by an um, inland uh, ice sheet that at some places is about three miles thick. And that um, cap is actually so heavy, it's pushing the land below the sea level. And also, if the cap were to melt, about uh, the sea levels would rise at about 70 meters, so that's quite a difference. Antarctica is also the, not only the polar opposite in terms of what pole it is at, it is also uh, the polar opposite in terms of the physical component because Antarctica is basically ice on a continent and then it's surrounded by ocean. But in the Arctic, that is actually all ocean and it's uh, that freezes over and it's surrounded by land, so it really is the opposite. Oh, one more thing. Uh, so marine ecosystems, um, they receive no impact from rivers, right? So all the carbon that comes into the system, um, it goes to the uh, phytoplankton, their primary producers, they're like microscopic plants, so, uh, so to speak. And so, uh, and they have high rates of primary production, but they don't depend on the land to pro pro provide some of that energy. Also, uh, adult penguins do not have any natural land predators. All the predators are all basically marine mammals, such as leopard seals. And just so you know, that 18 countries operate research stations in Antarctica year-round. And the nice thing uh, is what you can encounter is that penguins will come up to you, and they're very curious. So you can have situations like these, I found it on the internet. So, Antarctica is really big. It's about one and a half times as large as the United States. So it's really, really huge. But in terms of the sea ice, so you know how sea ice will build 
um, the, towards the uh, Antarctic winter and then it melts again and it disappears. And so in essence what you can see almost is that Antarctica is breathing in and out with this cycle. And here's a graph that shows you a little bit about when the Antarctic sea ice is at, is at its minimum. This is in the Antarctic summer. And then it grows and grows and grows up to its maximum. And then it melts again until the next summer. So it's a pretty neat cycle. So before I tell you a little bit more about the climate change effects on Antarctica, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the instruments that we have equipped ourselves with. So the first one, it's our research vessel. This is a lean, mean measuring machine. It has a whole bunch of instruments on board, and I will tell you a little bit more about them. So this ship is called the Lawrence and Gould, and this was named after um, an explorer back in the 1920s who helped uh, provide the Admiral Byrd uh, expedition. It's the flight across the Antarctic. So he was involved in that. So what I want to do is give you a little sense of how it feels to be on the ocean. So I'm taking you on across the Drake Passage right now. So this ship has many different research facilities. It's not a big ship, but we make the most use of the little space that we have. So in this lab, you can see two scientists here, uh, and they are uh, aligning the krill, and they'll be measuring the length and the biomass of the krill. Here's another lab, and they measure some bioacoustics. It tells them where the krill are. Um, they also can measure uh, where the phytoplankton are by measuring something called chlorophyll fluorescence. It's basically a measure of photosynthetic activity. And this is the lab that I'm in. I'm kind of over here in this corner. And this is where we do microbial biogeochemistry. It's a pretty exciting title. Um, we're looking at microbes and nutrients in the water column. We also have some external labs. So these are on the back deck. And these are labs uh, that we use to do isotope measurements. So there is um, isotopes that, so like uh, oxygen has two different kinds of isotopes, like 16O and 18O. Um, here we are measuring in this particular instance, this is me and I'm measuring uh, uh, the activity of the microbes by using a tracer uh, that's actually tritiated hydrogen. And the microbes will take that up and we can measure how much they've taken up by putting it on a machine that tells us how much radiation came out of it. So this is the instruments on board and there's a whole bunch of measurements that are being taken. We know the latitude and longitude, for example, and there are some temperature measurements, there are some barometric pressure measurements, we know the salinity, we know the depth. Every time we go on this vessel anywhere, there's this echolocator, the echo sounder, and it's pretty amazing. It just tells us how much ocean there is below us. It's pretty impressive. One of the really impressive um, um, equipment that we have, they're called slow cone gliders. And these are gliders that they are also known as um, autonomous underwater vehicle. And they don't require a lot of energy. The, the only thing that they need really is uh, just a set of uh, some batteries. Um, and they can be in the water for about five or six weeks before the energy runs out. And what these gliders will do is they travel, they zigzag down the water column and back up again. And they propel themselves forward just by changing the buoyancy. And this is pretty amazing. It's very efficient use of the little energy that they have. And they can measure a whole bunch of, uh, um, like, uh, on the physical environment, like temperature, salinity, light levels. They can measure the, uh, where the phytoplankton are. They can measure where the krill are. It's pretty impressive. And just as an example, uh, this is some data that the glider will be turned. And so this, these are temperatures. You can see there's some water, warmer water, and it's welling up here towards the surface. There's some cool water over here. Um, and the neat thing is, uh, and this is being combined by uh, this by penguins that have satellite uh, tags attached to them. And with these satellite tags, the penguins, we know from the penguins how far they go, how, how deep they dive, how often they dive. And so we know where they're foraging, which is great because now we can tell 
the gliders that I showed you earlier as to where they need to go to get some more information because they can tell us why the penguins are there. So here's a picture of the, what the glider took and, the, and this is a measure of um, the chlorophyll fluorescence that tells us how much phytoplankton there are. And with our phytoplankton, there's possibly krill that are feeding on the phytoplankton and krill is the food of these penguins. So you can tell we really like the slope on gliders. So this is Oscar Schofield. Um, he's at Rutgers University. He's one of the main scientists on this project. Now we also measure uh, zooplankton. Zooplankton are basically um, animal organisms that kind of wander, float about in the sea. They're called plankton because they don't, they cannot purposefully go somewhere. They just go where the waves take them. And so there, this is a, this is a net toe. Um, and what we catch in here, they, they sample the surface waters, and you can see we can get a lot of krill, and there's some copepods some polychaetes and a tiny little squid and there's some jellyfish as well so we get a whole bunch of organisms in our in our nets but most abundant are the krill so here in the top which is the main base of the whales the penguins and the seals we can also sample uh, krill and other zooplankton at different depths and this is called this is a net that can open and close at different depths. This is called a mock nest. I don't know. It, it stands for multiple opening, closing, net, environmental sensing system. Mock nest, for short. I think somebody just had fun coming up with the name. In any case, what this does is it can track the daily migration of the krill to deeper depths and as they come back up to the surface. So this happens on a daily basis. Now the other neat thing is uh, we have these uh, wonderful um, Liskin bottles. These are these are uh, positioned on a rosette, and then we lower them all the way to the bottom of the ocean. And then as we take them back up again, the bottles will close one by one, and they can sample water at all those different depths. So this is pretty amazing because at four kilometers depth, the pressure really increases. So the, um, at the sea level, the pressure is one atmosphere, which is the same as 14 and a half pounds per square inch. But we don't feel that, do we? It's because we have fluids in our body that are pushing with the same force towards that. But once you go into the water, just a few feet deeper, you can feel the pressure on your ears and all that. So can you imagine going now four kilometers depth? So um, if anybody's interested, I actually brought um, with me in my bag styrofoam cups. We drew on these styrofoam cups beforehand, and then we attached a, like a potato sack to this CTD, and then we lowered them at four kilometers, and they collapsed quite a bit. So I will show you if you're interested. Um, in any case, so what they collect, uh, we will measure from those, the microbes in water, what kind of phytoplankton there are, the, the numbers, the size, we'll measure a little bit about carbon and oxygen in the water and salinity and temperature. So really uh, a lot of uh, variables, as you can see here, here's where the CTD, the CTD came back on the ship and now we're sampling from those. And here's uh, the phytoplankton lab, so they'll be measuring the productivity. Another really cool sampling method is that um, this is called the sediment trap. So most of the productivity in oceans is only in the upper layer of the ocean, the first 100 meters. So much activity, but the ocean can be four kilometers deep in this area. So some of the particles that are from the surface will rain down to the deeper areas. And this is a way that, because I'm a carbon person, I'm thinking in carbon terms, a lot of carbon can get transported down to deeper depths where it's taken out of the active cycle. So this is a cool way where, where atmospheric carbon is being reduced and it goes down deeper in the surface, uh, below the ocean surface. Um, and so this is really important for the global carbon cycle because a lot of the carbon from the atmosphere is taken out um, this way. And this is, um, so as uh, John mentioned, I'm also an artist, so they asked me to draw a flag over here. I'm busy um, drawing a flag and here the sediment trap is being redeployed to be picked up again the next year.
So my favorite sampling method, and maybe yours as well, is how do you take uh, tissue samples from whales? Well, we actually shoot the whale. But with a little tiny pencil thin dart, and then uh, when it hits the whale, it bounces off the skin, and then we pick it up, and there's a little bit of blubber in there. That's all we need. So, as an example, I want to show you how that looks like. So, there's two humpback whales, and we just shot the first one, and we just got our sample. It's that simple, and they didn't even feel it. At least that we know of. Another really cool sampling method as well how do you sample the penguins? Well, it's actually really easy because the penguins don't run away from us. Right, so it's easy to uh, measure the size of their beaks, it's, it's easy to put them in these bags, to weigh them, so we're getting the weights of the fledglings. It's pretty amazing, and as I mentioned, penguins are not afraid of humans because they don't have natural land predators, and we don't hunt them. So we can get actually pretty close to these colonies, um, but according to the Antarctic Treaty, if you ever do go to Antarctica, you cannot approach a penguin, so we are we have to stand at least five meters away from these penguins. Uh, but if they decide to come up to you, that's okay, because that is their choice. Um, when penguins uh, come out of the water, and we have seen probably images and like documentaries where they land, uh, come out of the ocean, hop on the land, and I don't think they can see very well, and this is also shown by this penguin. He hopped out of the water straight onto our zodiac. It's pretty funny. And they really do go around their, doing their own business, even while we're doing our work. And it makes it really fun to see them walking around here. So, sampling penguins is easy. So, let me show you some of the scientists that are part of this project. So, here's David Johnston. Um, he is the whaler, so he's the one that takes the whale samples. Here is Donna Fraser. Um, her husband wrote a book about climate change in Antarctica, and I'll talk a little bit about that book later. Uh, but she's a seabird scientist. Uh, this is Oscar Schofield. This is the one that was hugging the silicon glider. Um, and he knows a lot about phytoplankton in these oceans. This is Debbie Steinberg. Uh, she's from uh, Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Uh, really amazing collaborator um, and knows a lot about the system. And this is the main scientist. He's the chief scientist, Hugh Daplo. And he's the microbial person on this uh, trip. So here's the Palmer Research Station area, and uh, this is the ship over here, and it's docked right next to Palmer Station. Um, Palmer Station is actually on an island called Anvera Island, and it's just off of the uh, Antarctic Peninsula, which you can see here, those are the tall mountains. As I said, they're kind of like the extension of the Andes. But you can also see beautiful lichen here on the foreground, pretty amazing. So one thing that we always do uh, on the cruise, this is done annually, the ship will travel in transects to each of these points and then they will take a whole bunch of measurements ranging from microbial communities, uh, phytoplankton size, krill abundance, um, so we'll take a whole bunch of measurements here and then we travel further and further south. So we start out in the north and then kind of like do the zigzag pattern further south. Um, and then, but this is also the area that has experienced the most rapid uh, warming. But more recently, they have actually been able to go even further south. So this is uh, because of the warming trend. So this area has been warming four times faster than the global average, which is a pretty fast rate. So you can see here on the map as well this really bright red area. And this is the Antarctic Peninsula here, this is the South America part. So you can see it's really red and the area has really been warming a lot. We also have uh, temperature measurements. Um, so here are uh, temperature measurements taken in the last 60 years or so. And these are the winter temperatures. And you can see that winters have actually increased in temperature by about 7 degrees compared to 60 years ago. And that's a really dramatic shift for a place that you know depends on the ice. So these uh, measurements are taken at Palmer Station. 
and they don't direct to go far as far back as the other station. This is a British station. So what happens, of course, if you increase the temperatures, uh, the sea ice duration, so the length of how long the sea ice will remain in the water, is not going to be as long anymore. And it turns out that um, that duration is shortened by about 90 days. And why is that? Is it because they're advancing later? Is it, are they retreating earlier? It is actually both. So it turns out that, remember that reeling cycle I showed you uh, before, it turns out that the sea ice is advancing about two months later and it retreats one month earlier, so that's about 90 days difference. So it's much shorter. And that has impact on the whole Antarctic ecosystem. And the other thing I wanted to show you is um, we can also look at the perennial sea ice, how much perennial sea ice is there. So if you look at, so this is, uh, if you kind of see the peninsula right here, and this is the water in the surrounding area, the dark blue means that that's where the perennial sea ice is, so this sea ice year round. And you can see that uh, there's no more, it's hard to see, but there's no more dark blue in this area where there used to be dark blue. So we don't have perennial sea ice in this area anymore. So a little bit about uh, food webs. Uh, so we have different levels of the food web. So we have uh, phytoplankton, which are the primary producers, and they're the base of everything. The microbes depend on them because the microbes need um, energy, they need organic matter, and they convert some of that into nutrients. But the krill, so the phytoplankton are basically plants in a sense, and so they're, they're grazed by, by the krill, and they're grazed on by fish. And then these, in turn, are being foraged on by seabirds and seals and whales as well. We also have a new organism coming into the area, and they're called salps. I put them here at the top of the food web because nothing eats them. We wouldn't eat them either, trust me. Alright, so one of the things that I wanted to show you is that phytoplankton do need sea ice. They do a lot better when sea ice is present. So when there's more sea ice or the duration is longer, we also tend to see higher uh, primary production once the sea ice retreats. And this is interesting because why is that? And let me also show you that uh, you can see that the activities are normally highest at the surface of the water. So this is depth. And this is the level of primary production. You can see at very shallow depth that there's a lot more uh, activity. And that is because this is also called a eupodic zone. It means that that's where the sunlight can penetrate. Plants need sun. These uh, phytoplankton need sun. And sunlight only penetrates so far into the ocean. So why do uh, the uh, phytoplankton do better in years with lots of uh, sea ice? Well, there's a few reasons, but here's a graph on the cycle between sea ice and chlorophyll. What you can see here in gray is the amount of the percent sea ice cover. So you can see the increase in sea ice cover and then the decrease, so the melting. And then you can see in green, these chlorophyll blooms happening right as the sea ice melts. Let me explain to you why that is. It turns out there's a lot of phytoplankton that's actually just sitting here in the ice when it's frozen. But when that ice starts to melt, all this phytoplankton gets released into the water column. And because the uh, sea ice melted, uh, a lot of fresh water is going to come in now, right? Because sea ice is fresh water that's basically it's frozen. And when it melts, now um, it decreases the salinity of the water, and it makes a very, very stratified water layer. Um, there's no tur turbulent action or anything. It's very stable. That means that the phytoplankton can remain on the surface and produce these beautiful blooms. You can see that uh, sea algae, they do grow underneath the ice, and so here is a sample of some ice. It's a little hard to see in this light, but there's some brown spots in there. They're actually diatoms, and they live underneath the sea ice. And here's a close-up photo of the diatoms. So it's a pretty cool phytoplankton. 
phytoplankton particularly have been very vulnerable to the decrease in sea ice duration. Um, here's a picture, there's the Antarctic Peninsula right here, and here's the water. So we measured phytoplankton in these areas. In blue, blue means that there's decreases in phytoplankton, and red means there's increases in phytoplankton. What we can see is in the northern part where the warming trends have been particularly strong, that the uh, phytoplankton biomass has actually declined quite a bit. But not just that, they also change in composition. It turns out that in the northern part where the blue is, the phytoplankton there got a lot, are a lot smaller, um, and that didn't used to be. So there are a lot more. Uh, there's so there's fewer diatoms, but there's also uh, more small cell phytoplankton. Whereas in the south, the phytoplankton's they're actually doing a lot better. You can see larger blooms in there. You can see that um, here where the red, this large area where they really increase. So not only, but also the composition is different. So first of all, we have more diatoms, but we also have uh, larger cell phytoplankton. So there the phytoplankton are actually larger in size, whereas they have decreased in size in the north. And to explain that difference in pattern, uh, this graph kind of explains that. So let me walk you through this. So in the northern region, we have used to have quite a bit of thick sea ice, and all that when it melted in the summertime would produce this pretty thick layer of fresh water and decreasing the salinity and increasing the stratification of the water so that the phytoplankton could just be at the surface. But in more recent years, uh, the sea ice is actually thinner. Less of that, um, there's less fresh water now to help with the uh, stratification. But also the wind speeds have increased, so the waters have become far more turbulent. And so what happens when the water gets turbulent, the phytoplankton don't want to be at the surface, suddenly get pushed down further down. And so they're not, there's less light, and so they're not as productive. But in the southern part, in the southern part, where there used to be a lot of perennial sea ice, you know, not a lot of light comes through, so the phytoplankton were not doing very well. But now we just have less, less of that ice and more light coming through, so the phytoplankton are doing better. The phytoplankton are very important because some other species, like the krill, depend on them. Here they are grazing on the meaty ice. And so this actually uh, is very important for krill recruitment. They are dependent on the phytoplankton underneath the sea ice. And so with the sea ice duration being uh, quite a bit smaller, we all, what we see over time is that the krill densities are defining over time. And instead, we have this tunica feeder, and they're starting to move in. Now, that also has repercussions for penguins. So this is called an Adelie penguin. And a lot of research has been done on the islands near Palmer Station. So this is on, excuse me. So this is on Torgerson Island. Um, and what you can see is there used to be a lot of penguins on this island, but the penguin populations have uh, have really dropped dramatically um, to less than you know 2,500 breeding pairs, and I think by now it's quite a bit smaller. Here, here's just a, a, a visual to show you the precipitous decline in the Adelie penguin population here in red. But then we have a different species of penguin called the Gentoo, and they're slowly increasing over time. So. The penguins in the northern part are not doing as well anymore, but they're doing better further south. So this is an avian island. It's um, about 400 kilometers south of Palmer Station. They're doing great. And so one of the things you might think of is, uh, well, maybe they just moved further south. And I can tell you, they probably did not. They actually have very high site fidelity, which means that where they breed and they produce the young, the young will come back to the same place where they grew up. Okay, so that's not the case um, in, uh, here, is that the southern populations are just doing better because their diet is better. So here's the uh, stomach contents of an Adelie penguin. You can see a lot of pink mass in here, Those are, that's krill. You can see this little silvery part in the metal and that's a fish. So the, the Adelie penguin diet has actually changed over time. 
Here's a quick picture, just some slices. Most of the diet is either Antarctic silverfish or krill, and not much of anything else. What you can see back in the day is that the fish comprised almost half of the diet of the penguins, and then uh, and then krill were the other half. But over time, what you can see is a uh, decline in that in that uh, in that red the fish. And so right now, there's not a lot of fish anymore in their diet. It's now mostly krill, as you can see in this photo. Whereas the species further south, where the population has been growing quite a bit, um, their diet is very similar to what it used to be for the northern penguins. So the declines of the uh, penguins uh, on the northern part of the peninsula is because there's fewer prey items, right? So there's, uh, there's less Antarctic silverfish. Silverfish only occur when the temperatures are below zero degrees Celsius, but warmer waters have, have pushed them further south. So there's, there's less fish, which explains why there's so few fish in the, in the penguins' diet in the northern uh, region. Uh, but also because we know that krill densities are declining. So, there's a feedback loop, right? So we have less krill, we have less prey over here. So now we have these penguin chicks, remember we measured their mass? Turns out they're getting lighter and lighter. So when they, when they become um, you know, old enough to go out and forage on their own, they can't make it very well. They don't have a buffer. They're too light to make it. So we have fewer penguins growing up into adulthood. And then what happens is, um, because we have fewer penguins, the colonies will be a lot smaller. And now there's these predators on land. They're called these birds are called skuas, and they will catch, uh, they will actually catch the uh, penguin chicks, and they're more likely to catch one if the colony is small. So you get this this feedback loop, right? Um, because when more chicks get eaten then less can go out in the ocean and we already know that their survival rate is going to be bad and they won't make it into adults. So it's, a, it's this positive feedback loop that just makes the penguins go into decline. Yeah, that's pretty sad. This was actually um, also part of a book. Um, I don't know if you remember the people I showed earlier, Donna Fraser, her husband, Bill Fraser, wrote this book. Uh, sorry, he's featured in this book. It's written by Ben Montaigne. And um, so my husband and I went on our first trip to Antarctica because we read this book. Uh, there was an interview on the Colbert Report by Ben Montaigne, and he said the Antarctic uh, Peninsula is in such, it's so changing that if you want to see the way it used to be, like Antarctica proper, you have to go now to see it. So that is why my husband and I went, and we loved our trip. Not only the Adelie penguins are in decline, but also um, the chinstrap penguins. So they look like, uh, I don't know if you know, the policemen in England who've got the little bobby hats, got little chinstrap, they remind me of them. So you can see that the penguin populations over time of the chinstraps have also been declining. And this is actually maybe even a greater concern, and that is because uh, chinstraps have a much narrower distribution than the Adelie penguins. So these are the gentoo penguins that are starting to move in. Actually, when my husband and I went on our trip together, this is pretty much the, uh, the only penguin that we saw. We saw a few chin straps, but more because we went to a particular area where they're known to be found. But other than that, the penguins we found were mostly these gentoos. So. I've talked about penguins so far, I haven't talked about whales yet. And that is because it's kind of harder to determine what's going to happen with the whales. If the internet works in this place, I have a video that I want to show you how, um, how whales are being affected. And so, um, from the previous slide, you can see that our ship is here in the background. And now we're on Zodiac. So the Zodiac and the ship are working together. Okay, it works. Okay, so this is the Antarctic Peninsula. We're zooming in on an area called Wilhelmina Bay. Um, this is Anver Island. We're going to go into this area over here where we have sighted a whale.
So there's a ship and it's measuring a whole bunch of uh, characteristics in the ocean, like temperature, salinity, quill abundance, phytoplankton. And then we have a little zodiac that comes out over here. And it also takes its measurements. Now the zodiac can take uh, finer resolution measurements, whereas the ship, it's a little bit more coarser. And you can see the spaghetti-like pattern here. And we got that because the whales were uh, equipped with a tag called a D-tag. So we know where the whales are going, we know their location, and now we are uh, purposely trying to find out where it is that they're foraging and why they are foraging there. So you can see the pretty fine scale resolution. Um, and this could be like krill abundance, it could be chlorophyll, you know, where the plants are. Now the whales feed on the krill, so this is probably the bioacoustics to tell them where the krill are. So both the zodiac and the ships, they're working together. The ship is doing this outline, broader area, whereas the zodiac is targeting the area where the whale is. And the neat thing is, you can see a little bit about how the whales are moving through the water, right? They're, often they're right at the surface, 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 but then there's some um, occasional instances where they actually go down uh, pretty deep. And so uh, what's going to happen now is we're going to move into one of the whales and you can see that um, the whales will plunge pretty deeply into the water column and then come back out again. You, can, you know the whales can deep, uh, dive pretty deep. So here we're zooming in on the, well I guess you can kind of see the whale. And it's going down and then going back up again and it's going to plunge very deep into the ocean. So now combined with the measurements, we know, you know where they're diving and what the conditions are in that water. All right, I hope you thought that was fun, because I thought so. All right, so some of the things that are occurring that we know of is that uh, certain ice-dependent species are declining in the northern peninsula and actually you can only start to find them further south. So, um, and then the not ice dependent species are actually moving into the area. So we're starting to see more and more of these elephant seals, the Antarctic fur seal, which is starting to show up. Usually they're on these sub-Antarctic islands and not found on the Antarctic Peninsula. And here are the, uh, the gentoo penguins. Uh, some fish are moving in, so this is called a lantern fish. And it's hard to see, but they do have some bulbs here on the back and they emit light, so it's pretty cool. So just a quick, uh, I know I provided a lot of information, so I'm just gonna summarize it down. Um, so what we do know of this area is that phytoplankton have been decreasing in biomass, and we also see that the diatoms, the larger plankton, are decreasing as well. But we see more of the tiny little uh, um, phytoplankton becoming more abundant. And that has repercussions for the krill. Krill densities are declining, and uh, this tunica feeder is starting to come in. And so, um, microbial communities are starting to change, and we're still trying to figure out as to how they're changing. Um, the phytoplankton are also being raised by the fish, and we see that the fish populations are changing. And this affects the seabirds and the seals, and we know that the penguin species are basically shifting. Uh, with ice dependent species moving out and uh, not ice dependent species moving in. But we don't know yet what's going on with the whales. So the take home message is that the species that used to be found all over Antarctica, some of the ice dependent species are moving further south. So that's basically the take home message. Um, so this is me uh, behind Palmer Station. Uh, towards this is actually the beginning of the field season. Um, and I'm about to go on that cruise that I just showed you. Uh, we also uh, did a lot of fun things. We uh, traveled down to the British Antarctic Station where we enjoyed uh, interacting with the British scientists there and that included a uh, soccer match. Uh, don't, yeah, don't call it football. <laughs> um, in any case, um, we lost. And we also uh, we had some day, uh, day trips with, uh, with the British and it was really amazing. So here I am, I'm going down this uh, crevasse 
in the ice, and then somebody is beneath the ice and is helping you to uh, make sure you don't, you know, fall or do something bad. Um, and so, but once you're inside, it's absolutely stunning. You're in this crystal cave. So that was really a lot of fun. There's actually um, a video I wanted to show you. There's a trailer out. I actually, I don't think it's going to work. Um, but uh, maybe what we can do is maybe on the Climate Science Center website, um, we can post a, the link to the video so that you can view it at your own time. But it's a pretty amazing uh, trailer and I hope you get to see the video. I'm in it a few times, but just in the background. <laughs> so, anyways, um, thank you for listening and I'll take questions. Thank you.